RFID technology has been around a really long time, 30 something years. And for the first 20 years of RFID tech, it was almost all high value asset tracking. And that was because RFID technology, the tags themselves were too expensive and unreliable to scale to the masses. So now fast forward to today, we're tracking commodity part consumption using RFID tags. People are like, they usually have a, a perspective of RFID that's old from 20 years ago. And they're saying, how is that even possible? Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at Digital Transformation Consulting Firm, Elevate IQ. RFID technology has been available for a long time, but its adoption has been limited to high-value assets. Most manufacturers might not believe that RFID technologies can track commodities, and be an excellent replacement for barcode labels. Unlike barcode labels, requiring warehouse and production workers to hold the pointed gun and scan each item, RFID techs could significantly save time while expediting the scanning process. They will also provide you real-time visibility and replenishment of the inventory. In today's episode, we have our guest, Henry Johnson, who discusses the evolution of RFID tags and how RFID technology is no longer limited to tracking high-value assets. He also touches on the old-school vendor management inventory approach and how RFID technology enables manufacturers to enable true just-in-time tracking in real time across products. Finally, he touches on the several logistics associated with enabling RFID to manage your vendor management inventory, including the cost of printing RFID labels, their limitations, and strategies for their adoption. Let me introduce Andrew to you. Andrew Johnson is an entrepreneur, inventor, and business owner, formerly the sales manager at the family distribution company O-Ring Sales and Service. He is now pursuing a new endeavor, a tech startup called Shelf Aware, which is attempting to redefine industrial supply chains by leveraging RFID technology, the internet, and the power of data. He is also lucky to work with his three equally talented and passionate brothers. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, welcome to the show, Andrew. Hey, Sam. Thank you for having me. Of course, my pleasure. Just to kick things off, do you want to start with your personal story and current focus? Yeah, sure. Love to. So my name is Andrew. I'm growing up in Kansas City inside the industrial manufacturing environment. So in the heart of America's Rust Belt, uh, grew up. Uh, my dad has started an industrial distribution company in 1982, a couple years before I was born. And so literally my entire childhood was wrapped up in industrial distribution from cleaning the floors to help him, um, you know, moving the company and boxing parts of accounting inventory. Those are all my summer jobs. And sometimes I got pulled out of school to help. And my, my dad was always a big believer in child labor. So I had lots of participation. Ultimately, though, I decided <laughs> I didn't want to go into the family business and thought, you know, I would quit and go to a different direction. Um, but I got pulled back into the business just a little bit later in my life uh, out of college. And so I started working for my father. Really weird story now, and I won't, won't bore you with all the details, but I have three sisters, no brothers. And all of my uh, sisters got married to entrepreneurial guys, and they hopped into the family business. So in 2012, I found myself working with three brother-in-laws to grow our family distribution business and at that point in time, we had a few what they call vendor managed inventory systems deployed inside the industrial distribution industry, and we thought they were terribly inefficient. We were on kind of an efficiency bent, and so between me and my three brother-in-laws, we came up with a system called Shelf Aware in 2016, which is a supply chain automation platform. Uh, we really just help equip suppliers to run automated supply chains uh, using some cutting edge technology, a little bit of IoT, that's the Internet of Things, mixed with RFID and some web-based applications, and you're off and running. So that was what launched me into my current focus, which is just purely licensing shelf-aware to industrial distributors to automate supply chains in the industrial marketplace. And our, our focus right now is really all over the board. So we're looking for traction and scalability in the OEM marketplace, but we're also looking at MRO, which is maintenance and repair, uh, and, and helping 
distributors do more efficient uh, distribution in, in that area as well. Okay, amazing. So you definitely have a very interesting background and we definitely want to dig deeper into that. And obviously supply chain traceability is always a hot topic. So it's going to be an interesting conversation. But before we do that, we have one of these standard questions and that is going to be your perspective on growth. When you think of the word business growth, what does it mean to you, Andrew? Okay, so I'm young. I'm still <laughs> not too wet behind the ears. And I... <laughs> I grew up in, in, in with a millennial perspective on growth and business growth. And that millennial perspective was kind of uh, shaped off of watching the Mark Zuckerbergs of the tech space and the Elon Musks like do cool things and blow things yeah. up to billions of dollars. So my initial concept of growth has changed a lot just in the last five or six years. I came uh, when the background, though, where basically my, my interpretation of growth was shaped very much by the consumer marketplace. But then once I started working with my dad, in the family business, which is the industrial marketplace, I found that growth is is really, really slow there. And by personality types, I like to see things go really, really fast. And so my concept of growth and reality of growth was actually really slow in the manufacturing marketplace have all basically collided. And I'm somewhere in the middle now. My, my idea of growth is building a platform that's scalable, meaning I can go both to supplier and consumer. That will give me faster growth. But having to come to the realization that in the industrial manufacturing marketplace, there are a lot of variables that will slow down your growth. And a lot of those come down to engineering and traceability and um, you know guidelines like the EPA and safety concerns, product liability at, at scale. And so all of those are gonna, are gonna slow us down from scaling like you're gonna see in the consumer marketplace. And so I guess that's a really convoluted way of saying I've matured to the point where I understand that, that to build something that grows fast in the industrial marketplace looks not a whole lot like anything in the consumer marketplace. So I've, I've set all that aside and, and I understand that fast growth is um, sustainable growth, I think. Okay, amazing. Great thoughts there. And now let's talk about some of the inefficiencies of the vendor management inventory system that you mentioned, right? And that was the yeah. trigger point for starting the shelf of your technology. So what were some of the inefficiencies that you saw in those technologies? What were the core business challenges that industrial distributors had at that time when they had access to those and did not have access to what you're working on right now. So what we were working with is the same technology everybody's been working with since 1980. So in the industrial marketplace, it is very archaic. And a lot okay. of the vendor managed inventory systems that were out there still predominant today are the same ones that, that ate your soda pop uh, money out of the soda machine or the snack machine in, in 1992. So there are these coil vending systems are very common. That's like a snack machine with industrial products inside of it. So we, we yeah. had that as an option. Another option that was out there was like barcode based systems. So this is where you're going to try and force factory workers, uh, blue collar folks that are on a factory production line who are, who are graded off of speed and quality. They're going to yeah. have to stop what they're doing and scan a whole bunch of barcodes to try and get things out of inventory and, and when, then worry about supply chain and inventory management. We knew that wasn't going to work. And, and we knew these things were silly and they weren't going to work. From a consumer's perspective, that'd be the manufacturer or the you know the consumer of those small parts uh, because of our experience and just growing up in this marketplace and, and working side by side, a lot of these folks on the consumer side, they told us that if we ever tried to launch a system like that, that was not just like magical to interact with and super fast, it wouldn't work. And then on the supplier side, so that's from like our, our personal distribution standpoint, we wanted a system that we could re deploy remotely. I mean, here we were in 2015 uh, when we rolled out Shelfware. And there were no real remote inventory management systems. I mean, every distributor that was running a VMI or a supplier collaboration platform was that platform consisted of people and trucks driving on location to factories and looking at inventory physically yeah. using a clipboard or a barcode scanner to manage it. And as far as we had gotten to this point was, OK, let's push those programs to a, a mobile app and now we'll use the person's phone. But they still have to go out in the field. They still have to drive their car to the factory or drive a truck the factory. And we knew that, hey, this is ridiculous. I mean, in 2015, 2016, we should be using the internet to monitor consumption of inventory remotely. Yep. And and so that's the system we came up with um, did just that. And so my little tiny family business started picking up supply chain contracts to manage on-hand inventory for large consumers across the country from coast to coast. And we stayed in Kansas City. We didn't open up branch locations. We knew we wanted to grow, but we wanted it to be sustainable, efficient growth. And that was our like core focus was how can we grow our business's uh, top line without growing our overhead. And I think our biggest, and I don't talk about this much, but like behind the scenes, my brothers and I, we wanted to grow the company, but not like lose our personal lives. So like we wanted to grow the revenue bigger, but not just 
be drugged down by all the minutia that comes with large revenue growth. But we wanted to grow big, but be really, really efficient. So we didn't want to like grow our overhead or pick up more people. We're huge believers in automation. And so our, our biggest claim to fame is basically tripling my dad's company's revenue, increasing the gross profit margins, but we kept the overhead 100% the same. So we didn't hire any more people. We didn't get a bigger facility. We didn't open up any branch locations. Our biggest investment was in inventory. And you really have to have that in the distribution world. So we bought more inventory and we grew our top line. So that's what our, our focus was, you know, in growing and, and launching this platform was we knew it had to be remote, had to be automated, had to almost feel magical to the consumer. And that would allow us to tackle the marketplace. Okay. So I'm still trying to understand how the technology is going to work from my perspective. So let's say if I'm the manufacturing CFO, and obviously, you know, my choice at this point of time, let's say if I'm the CFO of a distribution organization, right? And uh, obviously my manufacturers are probably asking me to do vendor managed inventory. And the reason why they are asking is because we are going to be sort of taking the hit from financially as opposed to them taking it, right? So that's why they actually want to move to this model. Now, from my perspective, let's say if I go to the older vending machines, as you said, my challenges are going to be in having the visibility of these inventory, or maybe I need to integrate those with my ERP system. And that's how I'm probably going to know what is sitting in those inventory and how I can replenish them, right? But you are saying that, you know, this is going to be slightly different. So tell us how the shelf-aware technology works and how it is going to be different from my perspective and how Mm -hmm. this is going to integrate, let's say if I may have the ERP system already and I need the visibility of the inventory in my ERP system. So how this is all gonna work, can you talk about that? Yeah, sure, so first off, Shelfware is software. It's a web-based application. It's really designed to be a bridge between two companies. These are independent companies, so supplier and consumer. So if you're a large manufacturer, you have a whole host of suppliers that support you. Uh, They support you with all sorts of different types of products. Some are commodities, some are engineered, but you need all your suppliers in order to run your factory because if you run out of, let's say, the smallest of part and it can shut you down. So what Shelfware is doing is partnering with the, the, the suppliers and the consumers, and our software really is a bridge between these two independent companies. So we're not designing an, uh, a web-based application to replace either party's ERP system, but we do do high levels of integration with both parties. The actual Shelfware system really runs on a technology that's been around for a long time called RFID, and I, I might have mentioned that already, but it's radio frequency identification. And what we do is we equip suppliers to attach RFID tags to product packaging. Uh, so basically, we call that smart packaging. Now, the suppliers yep. that are on the platform ship the inventory to the manufacturer's facility. It gets received into their system, and we can do that through an integration. Uh, and that, that manufacturing inventory then sits on the factory floor and waits to be consumed. The moment it's consumed, meaning it's walked away or taken you know, out of this, what we call a virtual vending machine or a convenience store setup, those are remotely monitored 100%. Uh, 24-7, 365 days a year. When that product is picked up and moved out of the inventory location, it's consumed onto the factory floor. We report that consumption in real time back to the supplier. And so we're we're fulfilling supply chains not based on forecast, but actual near-term demand. So consumption drives replenishment. So we're matching supply with demand. It's about as lean as you can get. And for the whole thing to work, the supplier has to carry some level of inventory to be just in time to the consumer. And the real, the really I would say like the the big picture for the consumer or what really gets them jazzed up about this is the platform play. So when Shelfware goes into one factory, we can automate a single supply chain pretty easily. So we, we put one of your trusted vendors on the platform. If the system works and you love it, then it's really easy to scale to another supplier or another vendor. And so what the, the manufacturers get, the consumer gets an omni-channel approach to their supply chain. So they have maybe start with one. It's an easy, easy, get your feet wet, get one supplier in there works great, great. Scale it to the next supplier. So Shelfware is agnostic. I'll work with any supplier. And then all of a sudden, a uh, year or two down the road, you have four or five different product verticals that are all supplied by independent product suppliers that you know and trust. And they're all through one omni-channel portal. That's the Shelfware uh, VMI portal that's online. So the consumer gets an omni-channel feel, one place, one-stop shop. They can see all their metrics and all their analytics. We push all the same data the supplier sees on consumption and on-hand inventory data. We push that to the platform, to the consumer, and that that just propagates uh, transparency and visibility so nobody's getting taken advantage of. Uh, We have complete accountability for the suppliers that are on the platform. It's basically just a a virtual vending machine, an online convenience store that we're running on a factory floor. Okay, so let's talk about some stories. And I don't know, I mean, the, uh, the, the word consumer could be slightly confusing for our audience because consumers is typically used in the consumer packaged goods industry. And in this particular case, I'm pretty sure you are not talking about that consumer. You are talking about 
the consumer who's actually consuming the product. In this mm-hmm. particular case, I, I guess it's going to be the manufacturer. So can you Correct. take example of the, let's say, any story or projects that you have done recently, talk about the manufacturing business first, okay? Who was the consumer? Who was the supplier? So let's say if they were doing, I don't know, maybe aerospace or automobile, I don't know. Okay, so yeah. just take an example of the entire story. Talk about their products, their processes. Sure, sure. So the, probably the best story to talk about is our very first, our very first integration, and that was with um, a company that was not too far from our our facility. They were running a current on hand VMI with us. We approached them and said, "Hey, we've invented the system. It's an RFID based system. It's going to allow us to monitor the consumption of your inventory. Uh, let us apply these smart tags to your packaging, and then put a small RFID reader." at your facility that allows to track your inventory and then keep you in parts, but keep you lean, but never stock you out. Uh, And they agreed. And so that company is called Eskridge Manufacturing. You can find like a testimonial on our website. There's lots of videos of uh, Eskridge uh, running the platform on our YouTube channel as well. But Eskridge makes gearboxes. So these are highly engineered gearboxes that go in all sorts of mobile hydraulic applications. And on their back end supply chain, they buy all sorts of highly engineered supplies, fasteners, hoses and fittings, abrasives, cutting tools, packaging materials. And I mean, here we were, we were a single supplier on O-rings and gaskets. And it was a, a, you know, a core product that they needed to consume. But we were fairly naive at the time, just thinking about our own little niche. We deployed the platform shelfware on our one little tiny niche o-rings and gaskets so those are like 250 inventory SKUs for them that they had to keep on hand and stocked and the platform works so well meaning they didn't have to do inventory accounts anymore no more cycle counts their employees champion the system because they could walk in from their manufacturing cells grab two or three bags of this o-ring a bag of this uh, wiper seal a bag of this rotary seal whatever they needed for their bom put it in a tote walk past the station single light flashes and they would go back to work it worked so well that their management, their CFO, their plant manager, they came back to us and said, hey, uh, we love Shelfware so much, but you're just an O-ring supplier. We want to put our janitorial supplies on it. We want to put some MRO supplies on it. We want to put fasteners and hoses and fittings on it. Now, in our family business story, this is kind of came to a head because my father, who started the business in 82, kind of had the old school mentality of distributors get bigger by adding product verticals. My brothers and I said, that's how they used to get bigger. They're going to get bigger in the future Um, by integrating new technologies and being more efficient and coming with product differentiators in the marketplace, Uh, not by adding product verticals because it's already been done before. Look at Fastenal, look at Worth, look at Granger, look at MSC. Those giants, we can't compete now. We're too late to that game. We're 20 years too late to that game. So what we decided to do was disagree with my dad, which led to a little bit of an argument, but you know that's family business. Eventually convinced him to sink more money and time into the shelfware software and hardware solution put it into more of an out-of-the-box out of licensable solution. And we ended up licensing that to a product vertical supplier uh, in uh, hoses and fittings. So now all of a sudden, Eskridge, the consumer, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm confusing anybody, but we see the manufacturer as the consumer because ultimately that's where these small parts go to die. They cease yeah. to exist as an individual part once they get incorporated into a larger assembly, like in this case, a gearbox. So Eskridge, the consumer, they were able to go to their next supply vertical that they had a partner in, uh, with hoses and fittings, and we licensed the system to the hose and fitting company. And we licensed the software, we set them up with the RFID uh, printer, gave them some training, onboarded them, and all of a sudden they were getting hoses and fittings and uh, kitting uh, assembly from them with smart labels on it as well. So they were using the same scanner, the same fixed RFID reader that we installed at their location for their employees to interact with, look for the flashy light now on two product verticals. Uh, a couple months later, we added fasteners to the platform, and a couple months after that, we've added packaging materials. So here we are, Eskridge, a single manufacturer, now has multiple product verticals through independent suppliers, all running on one supply chain platform. And what they loved about it was they never stocked out a product because the supplier can see in real time that they're trending towards zero. So in, in the old school VMI approach, you had an individual that was driving to a facility and they might have two or three days between visits. Those two or three days, who knows what happens at the factory? Maybe there's a huge spike in demand and, and the product that was on the shelf on a Monday is now gone on the Wednesday. On the shelf or platform, since the consumers are walking out with package quantities and we're tracking those quantities in real time, we can tell when they're trending towards zero. So they'll get automated alerts and triggers to the supplier saying, hey, you're about to stock out on this particular item so we can be proactive to make sure it doesn't run out. And then over the course of months, we put together enough consumption data on a part-by-part basis and we can drill each item down to its leanest point without stocking the customer out. So we were seeing inventory turns of, of 12 to 20 times, depending on product vertical or product groups. So that means the manufacturer is turning their inventory more than once a month. And that's a really high turn ratio for 
uh, engineered product verticals because they usually have long lead times. Um, so it means usually you're carrying a lot heavier inventories because you're buying off of blankets and traditional di- traditional purchase orders. But with the shelfware system, it's all JIT and it's all run over the internet uh, and you get real-time consumption data. So Eskridge is probably our, our most fun uh, use case scenario because it scales so quickly to four product verticals. Okay, so I'm actually trying to understand, you know, let's say if I want to utilize this for myself, and in this particular case, I guess you went from one product to the next, and uh, my understanding is this, the manufacturer or the consumer, as you are describing, was the driver for these packaging changes. So I don't know if they were able to dictate to their distributors that, you know what, if you want to supply these products to me, then you have to make these packaging changes so that I'm able to track. So who is the the driver here? Is that the manufacturer who's driving and they are dictating to their supplier that you have to utilize the shelf aware technology as part of their packaging or I'm not buying the products from you. So can you talk about the, you know, who starts the process? And let's say if the supplier does not follow that, what happens next? Yeah, so the interesting position I'm in now as this platform provider is, uh, you know, I'm a bridge between supplier and consumer or supplier and manufacturer. And so it can really start in either direction. I have found that um, in my short experience, the manufacturing method is much faster. So if the manufacturer wants the technology, they tactfully broach the topic with valued supply partners and encourage them to adopt the system. That That is a pretty quick sales cycle for, for me. So that's when I have um, you know the consumer, the manufacturers on board. Uh, they, I've sold the uh, value-added service, the transparency, the visibility they'll get on the omni-channel approach to shelfware. And then I will go with them to encourage their suppliers to get on the platform. The other direction it can go is I can go to industrial distributors and industrial suppliers who are looking for that next level collaboration with consumers or that next level of, of vendor managed inventory systems. And maybe they're currently running a whole bunch of archaic vending systems, or maybe they have people all over in branch locations who are physically on site monitoring inventory consumption and they, they want to find a more efficient way to grow and scale their their vendor managed inventory services. Uh, and so the way I approach that is with uh, basically a sales pitch to the supplier saying, here's how you're running VMIs today. On the shelf for platform, you can run them much more efficiently. You can scale them much faster. You can go coast to coast with them without branch locations and infrastructure and people and trucks. And I will sell them on the cost savings of it. And then they will pitch it to their consumer as a value added differentiator. So that, that way of selling the platform um, and scaling it is slower. Uh, but certainly going through the manufacturer, getting them on board to the technology and showing them that they can have visibility and transparency on the consumption of their inventory uh, and then use that to drive supplier efficiencies is a much quicker way to do it. Yeah. So, I mean, from your perspective, it is great. But obviously, you know, for this podcast, we are looking for what we can do for the manufacturers and distributors. So one of the things that you mentioned uh, is related to distributors that, you know, if they were utilizing this technology for them, I mean, it is actually going to enhance their value prop and they are probably going to be able to close the deals much faster or maybe able to differentiate with their competitors because now this is going to be far cooler technology. Their manufacturers are going to be able to trace this in their plant. So obviously that is a huge value prop in my opinion from the distributor perspective. Also from the manufacturer perspective, there is a huge value prop because they are able to do you know a lot more GIT and they are able to track everything that they were not able to do this before. So let's say if I'm the manufacturer or the distributor, and I'm actually trying to understand what all do I need to do in order for me to be able to utilize either this technology or the packaging, right? So one of the things that you mentioned that, you know, the RFID chip needs to be installed as part of the packaging. So I don't know if you are going to be recommending the packaging or you are going to be working with the packaging supplier. So tell us the the overall process how the chip installation works. And I don't know how small or big the chip is, you know, if yeah, yeah, yeah. have a lot of implications on the packaging. So can you talk about the, the implication from the packaging perspective? Who typically bears the responsibility for that? Sure. And this is where it gets pretty mind blowing. It's hard to convey over the odd, like over an audio podcast, honestly, because you would need like visuals to display how powerful this is. But RFID technology has been around a really long time, 30 something years. And for the first 20 years of RFID tech, it was almost all high value asset tracking. And that was because RFID technology, the tags themselves were too expensive and unreliable to scale to the masses. So now fast forward to today. We're tracking commodity park consumption using RFID tags. People are like, they, they usually have a, a perspective of RFID that's old from 20 years ago. And they're saying, how is that even possible? Well, the mind-blowing part is 
the, the barrier of entry for any supplier to hop on the Shuffle platform is almost nil. They have to buy an RFID printer from Zebra. It's a Zebra ZT410. They probably already own it. They'd have to buy a wireless RFID gun that does on-hand inventory audits in seconds instead of hours or days. Uh, that's $1,000. Uh, so the barrier of entry for the supplier is a little less than $5,000 to get on the Shuffle platform because Shuffle is a SaaS. So we're a software as a service. We're equi- equipping these suppliers, but we're not selling the software outright up front. It's a it's a licensing deal that goes month to month. So it, it allows for, for really easy, low barriers of entry and scalability. Now, the actual tags themselves are about a nickel. And it really depends on on what label size you want. So shelfware can be incorporated into any label. So this is a peel and stick label. The, the actual face of the label, the readable information, is usually customized completely for the manufacturer. So whatever the manufacturer wants on the inbound label, we can put that on there. From the supplier's perspective and from Shelfware's perspective, all we care about is the data that's encoded on the RFID tag that's embedded in the label. So Shelfware, we will work with the supplier and the consumer to figure out what label size they want. And maybe they need a special tag type or a special label. Perhaps there's a bribe like, you know, maybe heat or temperature, you know, temperature requirements, but typically no. And the, and the labels are, are really inexpensive. They are sold to the supplier. The supplier has a roll of blank labels. And every time they go to ship product to the consumer, they pull down a data file that constitutes not only the RFID encodation, but the actual printing of the readable information on the tags. And the tags are printed and encoded by the Zebra ZT410 on the fly at the point of shipping. Products packaged. Now all of a sudden you have boxes, bags, totes, pallets, uh, any type of container or packaging that's now made smart by this peel and stick label. Label goes to the consumer's facility. Now all the smart packaging can be interacted with via the handheld gun or a scanning, fixed scanning station. And those are extremely cheap. They're up 24-7 and provide real-time visibility for both supplier and consumer once they're installed at the factory. Okay, so I'm a bit confused. If RFID printing is so easy, why are manufacturers and distributors are not using the RFID text and why are they using the barcoding at this point of time? I mean, majority of the manufacturers and distributors, they, they still have the barcode, right? They are still trying to uh, trace using the barcode. I mean, they can use RFID, but why are they using it right now? Is it because of the cost? And you mentioned that it's fairly cheap. So what would be the reason why? Are there any limitations in RFID text? Is that the reason why they are not using right now? That's a really great question. When, when we invented the system in 2016, we were wondering the same thing. Like, why the hell has nobody else done this? Uh, and honestly, there's not a lot of limitations. So RFID has had two limitations that I can think of since the beginning of the time that they've actually come up with a lot of solutions to get around. And those two limitations are liquids and solid metal objects. And so radio frequency, which that's the transmitter of data. So we're proximity based, we're non-visual. So barcodes have to be looked at by a laser to be read. RFID tags, they can go through substrates. So you could have 30 RFID smart packages inside of a box and you can read all the data from the packages that are inside of a cardboard box without actually opening the box. So that's the power of RFID. And the only two limitations really are lots and lots of liquids or solid metal objects. But the RFID industry has come up with, just in the last five years, tag types that are really, really cheap, like pennies per tag at volumes, pennies per tag, that can be peeled off, printed, printed and encoded through these really inexpensive printers reliably, and then peeled off and stuck to solid metal and liquid objects. So to answer your question, I I don't know. I mean, I would think the biggest inhibitor of them pursuing, meaning manufacturer pursuing more RFID integrations in the facility is probably on the software side of things. I don't think a lot of manufacturers have a great handle on their data. And I think that's probably the biggest issue that they're facing is integrations of internal systems and, and being able to leverage the RFID encoding information from place to place to place inside the facility. The, the number one question I get asked at by all manufacturers when I install the shelfware system in their back end supply chain is, can you use the shelfware system to track my work in process? So I'm sure there's somebody out there today working on that solution from an RFID perspective, but it's just not us. But they have to be because it's gotten so cheap. So I don't know. I'm not really answering your question because I still don't know why. So basically, work in progress that you mentioned, I mean, it's not really the technology limitation from the RFID perspective. That's your platform limitation that you are not able to use the the VIP, right? I mean, see, let's say if you had the software capabilities, then you would be able to track the, the VIP as well. Is I would, right? yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I guess what I'm saying is RFID and Shelfware, as the technology is laid out today, could track WIP. I'm just trying to stay committed to sustainable growth in supply chain. And WIP is just too far outside of my, not only my expertise, but also my software development currently. So 
if somebody was going to walk up and say, hey, here's uh, you know $5 million to um, invent a, a warehouse management system or a whip tracking system for manufacturers, leveraging RFID technology, this peel and stick smart label, I would do it if I could you know fund a team to do it. I, there's tons of opportunity. It's certainly out there. And I honestly could not tell you, other than the, the, the lack of data infrastructure, the lack of technological infrastructure, and that's all just been a, a, a product of the U.S. manufacturing has been neglected for for decades. Okay, so let's talk about the interaction with the the ERP system. So I don't know how big the manufacturers are that are working with you, and I'm very interested in the uh, that interaction because majority of the manufacturers that I have seen, they are going to have some sort of ERP system, right? And the inventory is mm-hmm. typically managed as part of that. So obviously, you know, if we have your platform, that is great. But I mean, end of the day, they have to track the inventory inside the ERP system, so they would require some sort of integration. So how does the interaction with the ERP work? I mean, I don't know if you are integrated with any of the existing ERP systems yeah. right now. And can you touch some stories where you had some ERP systems and you integrated with that? Do you have any yeah. stories there by any chance? Yeah, I do. Um, so first off, Shelfware guarantees a return on investment for both supplier and consumer without any level of integration. And, that, and that's by design. So we have a really low barrier of entry and we guarantee uh, ROI because we knew that a lot of the manufacturers and the suppliers that we were going to work with didn't have the data infrastructure to even accommodate an integration. So I'll tell you, Sam, it's pretty surprising to me, but I'll start working with businesses, whether it's the supplier or the manufacturer. And I find out pretty quick that they have an ERP system that can integrate with uh, outside systems you know, to automate data entry through EDI or through an API. But oftentimes they have a poor handle on their own internal data. And so I'll say, yeah, look, just provide me what table structure do you want? What file type do you want? Can you interact with this API language? Uh, JSON is what we like to use or something like that. And there's just a blank stare. And they don't have the IT infrastructure to really accommodate me. So number one, Shelfware does not require an integration to get an ROI. Now, if they want to do an integration, the common types of integrations for us right now at the manufacturing level would be integrating a... um, Either the, the, the lowest form of integration for us is providing the manufacturer an importable data file. This would be a data set that is um, massaged. So it can be brought straight into their ERP system to automate purchase order entry and receipt of goods. So if they want to track the, the inventory that's shipped from the supplier through the shelf system, they can pull down an importable data file on each one of these orders. They're usually replenished on a weekly basis. And so every week they'd log in to the shelf system, pull down an importable data file, a couple clicks of the mouse and all that that data would be pushed into their ERP and it would make a purchase order probably several hundred lines long. And then subsequently, when the product was received into their system, they would do that with the same type of process. So a couple clicks of the mouse. Now, if they had the platform pushed to several suppliers and they're receiving shipment maybe every day, uh, they don't even want a purchasing agent or supply chain agent to actually have to do the clicks of the mouse. And we would do what they call an API integration. So a it's similar to EDI, but it's um, application programming interface. We create a program that runs in the background that helps the two systems shuffle aware and their ERP talk. And we've done that already with several big names, but SAP, JD Edwards, Epicor, a couple that come to mind. Okay, amazing. Do you have to do any other integration other than just ERP as part of your engagements, or is that the only thing typically? You know, there's really no other like integration hurdles other than security. So, and I've I run into this a couple of times, but for Shelfware to operate, we have to install a RFID reader at the manufacturing facility. And that reader has to have access to the internet. So sometimes I've faced a, a few hurdles when it comes to security. So larger manufacturers like um, we've worked with Ingersoll Rand in the past, they don't want to let us onto their local area network for fear of just security risks and opening up their local area network to any sort of attack. And so um, we'll either have to create a separate network that our little RFID readers will run on, or we actually just go to cellular. Uh, that's really the only other concern I can think of from a data standpoint. So since you mentioned that point, and obviously cybersecurity is going to be a huge risk for manufacturers and distributors, and that is uh, being pushed a lot from the insurance companies, from the claims companies. Is RFID secure? What, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, RFID can be made really secure. Our tags aren't encrypted. Yeah, because the information that's actually stored on the tag, tag is fairly meaningless to any outside party. So we're not tracking like financial data. We're not tracking part number data even uh, or descriptions of the parts. We're actually on the RFID tag encoding a fairly meaningless number. That number, okay. when applied to the shelfware database, we call it a data key. It unlocks a data set about that package. So we can tell you everything about what's inside that package based on the data key code. But if you were going to use RFID to track more sensitive information, they have encrypted types of tags 
that you can actually, you have to provide the tag and encryption before the tag will allow you to write data or read data from it. All right, that's it for today. And do you have any last minute closing thoughts by any chance? Yeah, I would say that manufacturers have a lot of work to do when it comes to, to IT infrastructure. Um, and from my viewpoint, they, they can do a lot of it organically. I would encourage everybody to get out there and look at the people and processes they're running today. There's lots of technology that can be applied very quickly uh, in the cloud environment and through third-party softwares. So I wouldn't be too hesitant or scared to, to work with anybody. I think there's systems uh, just like Shelfware that are popping up uh, all the time that offer really low barriers of entry for you to like play around, dabble, and experiment. And, and in the American manufacturing space, honestly, we just need to get more messy dirtier. We, we really have no time to spare because the rest of the world from a manufacturing perspective has had a large head start. So like Southeast Asia is huge on automation, and huge on data-driven um, ROI and success, success stories. So I think from a U.S. manufacturing perspective, it's time to get messy. It's time to try some new things. And there are a lot of things you can try from a third-party software perspective. Okay, amazing. And my personal takeaway from this conversation is going to be shelfware and RFID is definitely prominent technologies in terms of supply chain traceability. Um, so this could be a good start for manufacturers and distributors to be able to start on the journey of GIT and also the, the traceability. On that note, Andrew, I want to thank you for your time. It's been insightful and fun conversation. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Andrew, head over to shelfawarevmi.com. It's S-H-E-L-F-E-W-A-R-E-V-M-I.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Chuck Coxhead from Presensus, who discusses warehouse mobility trends in the enterprise and SME markets. Also, the interview with Mike Ryan, who discusses how to do sales and operations planning appropriately for a growing business. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to get you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.